Good morning. Once again, I welcome you all for online analysis at 2023 in a new version, sponsored by Akrula and hosted by Evan Logics and aired by Anasisa TV. This year, we de dedicate the sessions to Anasisa consultants to update their knowledge. It is going to be once a month meeting. At first meeting of this year, 2023, we have two interesting topics today. A new technique, spinal segmental anesthesia, that was added to our anesthesia armamentarium very easy recently. Let us look into the advantages and disadvantages of this new technique. For that, we have Dr. Naresh Pariwal to discuss on that. Since there is no data available in the textbooks, he will share his experience with us. I hope when this technique enters the textbook, he is likely to be called as the father of segmental anesthesia as he has done a lot of research and workshops on this. The second topic is highlighting the technique which holds still the golden standard, segmental epidural. For that, we have Dr. Silaman sir, the pioneer in region anesthesia techniques. He is my teacher also. I am having a lot of questions running in my mind. In old textbooks, there is epidural anesthesia by Bromage. Bromage used to say a resident who has performed 50 successful spinal anesthesia is eligible to do lumbar epidural. Similarly, a resident who has performed successfully 50 lumbar epidural is eligible for thoracic epidural. So, the segmental spinal, is it for the beginners or experienced seniors? Is it for high risk patients, CA series 3 and 4 or for elective cases, ASA risk 1 and 2? So, I am eagerly waiting to listen to Dr. Naresh Paliwal's lecture for these answers. To carry out today interesting session discussions, we have senior consultant anesthesiologist Dr. Kalyana Sundara Ramavendran. Sir, he is currently associated with the multi specialty corporate hospital in Chennai with over 40 years of experience. His area of interest is pain and ICU. Expertise in airway techniques, region anesthesia, organ transplant, and interventional pain. He delivered many lectures in CME and conferences. On behalf of online anesthesia, we welcome you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Edward Johnson. Am I audible? Yes, sir. We are audible, sir. Please. Okay. So today we have a good morning, everyone. We have a very interesting session today for about two hours. And um, we have two eminent speakers who are most suited to deliver the lectures allotted to them. Uh, namely, they are they're going to have some sort of a debate. It's going to be a very healthy one, actually. So we have Dr. A. Silamban. And uh, let me have the privilege of introducing him as a chief anesthetist and intensivist at VHS um, Chennai. He is an alumni of uh, Madras Medical College, Chennai. He has a uh, special interest in regional anesthesia and interventional uh, pain relief. And he's recipient of uh, KPR Young Anesthetist Award in 2005 from Kerala State Branch of uh, ISA. He has been uh, doing these epidurals for a very long time now. And uh, probably he is one of the uh, well-known authorities in the area of uh, no, neuraxial uh, like the epidurals. And um, he is sort of confining himself to the, you know, uh, the behind the uh, dura. So he's not trying to breach the barrier of dura. But we have with us uh, to, to sort of, you know, uh, to cross the barrier and tell us more about spinal is uh, Dr. Naresh Paliwal. Okay? He is uh, an associate professor of anesthesia working at uh, DRPD MMC at Amaravati, Andhra Pradesh. He is uh, a well known person now because uh, of late his name is being uh, quoted in uh, most of the seminars and conferences in India as well as in international circles. And he's a, in a faculty in various national and uh, state conferences, plus international forums. And he has um, got a lot of interest in um, spinals. It's an age -world, world technique, but he has modified suitably to sort of uh, you know, um, uh, deliver the anesthesia for even uh, surgery which are not possible under spinals, like major abdominal procedures, thoracotomies, um, etc., mastectomies, etc. He has had about 28 presentations on segment spinals uh, in the uh, past two years. And he's published in many um, uh, on segmental spinals, international and national journals. He's conducted two live workshops in, uh, on segmental spinals in the year 2022. 
and also he has uh, published uh, and presented on XKIT, which is quite a very interesting combination and works well in many um, situations. And he got a best paper award for DexKit presentation in the Ludwig's Angina. So now uh, we are going to start off the debate. Uh, Dr. Salaman is going to tell us about epidurals first. He has been doing it since 2002, I heard. And, um, and practically, probably he has been doing it for most abdominal and maybe even thoracotomies and even neck cop procedures also. So he is an expert in that area. And then we are very um, uh, sort of you know, eagerly waiting for his uh, lecture. And also like to know about uh, the segmented spinals. So what exactly it involves is that they are able to control the spread of anesthetics by some special techniques, special agents, adjuvants, and also area which are not probably if not considered before, like thoracic uh, level. So now let me just hand over uh, to Dr. Salaman first, who will start his um, uh, lecture on, um, on segmental epidurals. Over to Dr. Salaman. Good morning, everybody. I think I'm audible. Yes, you are. Uh, good morning to Dr. Naresh Paliwal, Dr. Edward, Dr. Agwender, and all the other people who are in the link now. I think we'll start with segmental epidurals. We'll start with the basic of lumbar and we'll move on to the cervical epidural. Let's see how each technique is being performed and how, how you decide on the volume for each segment and how you go about the procedure. See, epidural anesthesia, when you call it segmental, it is something that provides blockade of the operative area and gives excellent patient comfort. General epidural anesthesia is something different. Segmental anesthesia is a little different from that. Earlier, when I was a postgraduate, when we used to give epidural anesthesia, even you let it be abdominal surgeries, we are always entering at L3, L4, L2, L3, pushing the catheter up by 10, 12 centimeters or pushing the catheter only by 5 centimeters and giving about 20 to 22 ml of local anesthetic and doing the procedure. That is how I was doing it when I was a PG. After finishing my post-graduation joining, something said that we must, something different must be done. So much of volume you give, uh, hemodynamic imbalance still exists in high-risk patients. For example, a block arises from T4 till your tip of the toe. Then you say, what is the hypotension that goes on and things like that. So that's what made me think about the segmental epidural. So what are the advantages a segmental epidural has over GA? There's a decrease in improper blood loss. Because we give good post-operative pain relief, there's a decrease in post-operative catabolism in the patient. And suppose when you have levels of up to T4, the stress response to surgery is reduced <laughs> because of early ambulation is possible because of reduced post-operative pain relief we give through the epidural. There's a decrease in incidence of thromboembolism. There's no polypharmacy. So there's a decrease in PYNV. Certainly there's going to be an improvement in perioperative pulmonary function, especially in abdominal surgeries. There's avoidance of polypharmacy, airway manipulations, all those things are avoided. And it's a very reliable technique in patients where we are contraindicated for general anesthesia also. So, okay, this is how, this is the, why I was talking about the advantages of epidural over GA. Now, epidural over non, advantage of segmental epidural over non-segmental epidural. There is better hemodynamic stability because only the operative areas are blocked. Other areas are not blocked. So, naturally, the vasodilatation is limited to that area only. For example, you are doing a breast. The vasodilatation is limited only from C6 to T6. The abdomen is pad. So the splanchnic circulation, there is no vasodilatation and there is a fall in BP. So you get better hemodynamic stability, especially in high-risk patients and cardiac patients. Better post-operative pain relief for the simple reason the catheter is placed so high and in the exact site where the operation has taken place that with low volume, itself, you get better post-operative pain relief. Toxic doses is never ex exceeded in prolonged surgeries or in prolonged post-operative analgesia because the volume of drug used 
is going to be extremely low. So naturally, there's going to be better patient comfort. There's going to be better patient movement. And it's quite comparatively very safe in the elderly and high-risk patients. So for convenience sake, or based on the type of the spines that are present in the body, let us divide it into lumbar, lower thoracic, upper thoracic, cervical, and cordon. Let us divide the epidurals into these areas because the technique of administration becomes different for each of these. So what are the principles of segmental epidural anesthesia? These are the basic points which you must know. These next two slides determine how a segmental epidural is going to be done. Any level you do, these five, six points which are going to talk now determines everything. My further talk is going to be only examples of what is being done at various levels. So this I want everybody to attach a lot of importance on what forms the basis of principles of segmental epidural. See, the important points you must notice, whenever you call something as a segment, I repeat, whenever you call something as a segment, there must be an upper level and there must be a lower level. So, suppose you are talking about a gastrectomy, the upper level should be up to T4 and the lower level should be up to T12. The lumbars are spared. So, that is what we call the upper level and the lower level. Next, so any surgery you decide for this surgery, what is going to be the upper level of anesthesia required and what is going to be the lower level till which it is required. Then you decide where you place the tip of the catheter. Then you decide what is going to be the length of the catheter inside the space. Then only you decide the site of needle entry and finally the volume of the drug. So you don't decide the site of needle entry first and then try to push the catheter as much as you want. So site of needle entry is decided after the first three points have been decided. That is how you go about it. So methodologies decide about the area to be blocked. For example, if it is a breast, it is from C6 to T6. If it is an abdomen, it is T4 to T12. Because planknic starts from T5. Planknic sucks uh, nerve supply to the abdomen. Then you decide where you are going to place the tip of the catheter. The tip of the catheter has to be placed in the center of the areas to be blocked or in the center of the segments which are to be blocked. Taking into consideration the moment you open the epidural space and the negativity is lost, the local anesthetic spreads equally on both sides of the catheter tip provided the patient is lying flat. Based on this, based on this we decide where we place the tip of the catheter is exactly the center of the areas to be blocked. Then you decide the length of the catheter inside the space. The length of the catheter should not be less than 3 centimeters and should not be more than 5 centimeters. If you are going to push the catheter too much, then what happens? The catheter coils inside, it kinks, it knots, it doubles up and comes down back to your needle site and it can also pass into the intervertebral foramen. If these things happen, then the volume of drug which you are going to give is not going to be sufficient. So the upper level may not be reached at all. Next, after we decide the length of the catheter inside, we are going to decide if less than 3 centimeters are placed, there is every possibility of a catheter exit, especially in the post-operative period. So 3 to 5 centimeters is what the length of the catheter I would suggest to place inside. Then we decide the site of needle entry. It is two vertebral spines or two segments below or above from where you want the tip. The catheter can be threaded cephaloid or the catheter can also be threaded caudally. So, for example, if you are planning 5 centimeters of the catheter to be inside, it's roughly you enter two segments from above or below, taking into consideration two centimeters of the catheter will have to be inside the space to cross one segment. Suppose you want 3 centimeters, then you enter from one segment below or one segment above, so that you have the catheter inside for 3 centimeters. This will be better understood when you go to examples. So, finally, we decide on the volume of the drug. This is an arbitrary, uh, uh, arbitrary volume which you have decided based on experience. Lumbar being a bigger space requires 2 ml per segment. The lower thoracic and upper thoracic require about 1.5 ml per segment. The cervical requires anywhere between 1 to 1.25 ml per segment. In the elderly, 
very obese, short stature, very dehydrated abdominal patients, you will have to decrease the volume by 0.5 to 1 ml per segment. These are my suggestions. So agents and regimen, what are you going to use? That certainly depends on what surgery you are going to proceed with. Some surgeries, extremely good relaxation is required and some surgeries, good relaxation not, may not be required. Good pain relief alone may be sufficient. For example, if you take up the abdomen, the surgeon wants good relaxation. You want to do a breast. The relaxation is not as important as it is in the abdomen. Suppose you are doing a hemiarthroplasty. Initially, you may feel that relaxation is not required. But when he has to reduce after fixing the um, implant, if the relaxation is not good. The hip muscles are not well relaxed. The surgeon finds it very difficult to push the head back into the socket. So this, all these things determine what drugs you are going to use. For example, my, for generally my personal preference would be for abdominal surgeries. My first dose is going to be 2% xylocaine with adrenaline. That certainly gives out of my experience better relaxation and uh, than 0.5% sensor gate. My second dose would be half of the first dose. My second dose would be half of the first dose. For example, my first dose is 10 ml. My second dose is going to be 5 ml. The third and subsequent doses, for about another two doses, you can continue with xylocaine or you can shift to bupivacaine because once the sodium channels are open, after that even if you give bupivacaine, the good relaxation that uh, xylocaine helped you achieve continues. The volume for the third and subsequent doses, I use one third of the first dose to a minimum of 4 to 5 ml. This is my agent and regimen choice. Fine. Now, let us, after finishing all that, we are now understood how to go about to proceed on a segmental epidural. Now, the segmental epidural, when it happens in lumbar, it is going to be very easy. But as you go up the spine, you will have to note the angulation of the thoracic spines and the lumbar spines and the cervical spines, which is going to make your technique very difficult. The angulation of the vertebral spine is very important in performing the epidural blockade. As you can see, in the lumbar side, the thoracic the spines are at 90 degrees to each other. So, if you just go between the two spines, you are likely to reach the epidural space. Whereas, when you go to the lower thoracic, say from T7 to T11, they are at about 70 degrees angulation. So, if your needle is not angulated to the angulation of the spine, you may have difficulty in reaching the epidural space. And one of the most difficult epidurals to perform is the upper thoracic epidural right from say about T3 to T6 where they are at 30 to 40 degrees angulation and to angulate a needle at that level and the deepest epidural space is seen only at the upper thoracic level. So for, a, for the same patient, if you reach the lumbar at 4, only at 6, 6.5 you lose it at the upper thoracic level because of the steep angulation involved. <laughs> So basically things that are suppressed to by the needle, skin, subcutaneous tissue, basic things. Now let us just have most of us perform lumbar epidural. But just for some postgraduates who might have joined, first year postgraduates, let us have a small talk about a lumbar epidural. What surgeries can you do? Hernia raffis, all lower and orthopedic procedures. And I think I should tell you one thing. Abdominal surgeries should not be done with lumbar epidurals. To reach such high level of anesthesia up to T4, you don't push your needle at L3, L4 and push the catheter up. So, I don't prefer doing abnormal surgeries with lumbar epidurals. Say, so example, let us take a simple basic inguinal hernia where there is not much of abnormal contents which have come out. The segments to be blocked according to the innervation as shown by the yellow coloring and also by the side diagram here is T10 to L2. So, this is what we are going to do. So, first we have decided what is the area of anesthesia we are going to give. The upper level is T10, lower level is L2. So, where do you place the catheter tip? Like I said, the catheter tip is going to be placed at the center of the segments to be blocked. That is at T12. That is where the catheter tip has to be placed. So, I decide to place 5 centimeters of the catheter inside. So, my site of needle entry is going to be between L2, L3. So, I take about 1 centimeter to cross L2, 2 centimeter to cross L1, 
and one centimeter roughly to come to T12. This has been confirmed in many studies by application of dye and with seeing it on a CR. So this roughly this calculation almost ends up the catheter being a T12. So we have one thoracic segment and three lumbar segments. So sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We have three thoracic segments and three lumbar segments. So lumbar is 2 ml per segment, that's 6 ml. There is 1.5. So it totally comes to 8.5 ml is what is required. This is how the principles are applied in the inguinal hernia. So this is a schematic representation. This, this is very common lumbar, which even the first year postgraduates are doing. So I thought we'll skip this video and go to higher levels. At this point of time, I would also like to tell the usefulness of cordially pushing the catheter downwards. Cordially pushing the catheter downwards is a very useful aspect, especially when you're doing tibial surgeries and surgeries with the foot and diabetic foot surgeries and all those things. It's very, very useful. You will treat the catheter cordially. The advantage is when you go cordially, most of the below the knee is all by the sacral segments. So you block only the sacral segments. Even the patient injection fraction is 20%, 22%. You're just not bothered because most of the sympathetics are not from the sacral region. They're all higher up. So vasodilatation is going to be minimal. And the only problem would be one portion or one piece of the foot and the leg is supplied by the saphenous nerve. That can be blocked by raising a wheel with the local anesthetic at the medial side of the tubal tuberosity. So you reverse the catheter, give a wheel of local anesthetic, medial tuberosity, below knee is anesthetized without hypotension. So this is how, for example, even we want to do a dynamic hip screw fixation, which is not done nowadays. Nowadays they do PFNs now. This is how you go about it. So you decide what segments to block, T12 to L4. So catheter tip is in the center at L2. So you get it to place inside is 5 centimeters. So needle entry is 11, T11, T12. You push it inside. Push it downwards. And at 9.5 ml per hour, things are over. Invariably, if it's an old person, like I said, you reduce volume, even 6 ml would be sufficient. Where minimal hypotension is achieved. Suppose in the same procedure, you want to do a tibial surgery or an ankle surgery. Enter at L4, L5. Push the catheter inside by 3 centimeters. Give over 6 ml of volume of local anesthetic and give a wheel of local anesthetic to block the saphenous nerve alone. That would be quite sufficient. Like I said, for tibial fixation, this is how we go about it. This video is about reversing the catheter, which is similar to a lumbar. So come, now coming to lower thoracic epidural anesthesia. Most abdominal surgeries, what most all abdominal surgeries should be done only with lower thoracic epidural anesthesia. Gastrectomy, incisional hernias, polycystectomy, whipples, perforation, resection, nemosis, everything has been done with lower thoracic epidurals. So like I said, again, here again, we're applying the principle of segmental epidural at the lower thoracic region. Segments to be blocked for a lower, for an abdominal procedure are from T4 to T12. So the catheter tip is going to be placed at the center, which is T8. Catheter length placed inside is going to be 5 centimeters. It is 5 centimeters. The site of needle entry will be between T10 and T11. So 1 centimeter to cross T, T1, T10, 2 to cross T9, and 1 to reach the middle of T8. So roughly 5 centimeters, the catheter tip comes to at 1.5 ml per segment. For this segment, you get 13.5 ml of local anesthetic. This roughly for a person who's uh, the height of 5'8", something. Women, all those things, you can reduce volume. Certainly, once you start doing it, you'll know how much volume to reduce. Women generally with 10 ml itself, you can proceed with intra-abdominal procedures. See, I was talking about the angulation of the thoracic spines. This, this picture depicts the lower thoracic spine, which is roughly at 70 degrees angulation to each other. So what happens if you feel the thoracic spine <coughs> or the skin and you go in between the thoracic spines, exactly in between the thoracic spines, like you do in a lumbar epidural anesthesia, 
as depicted by the green line you will see that you are most likely to go and hit on the upper part of the lower spine if you go straight so then it makes manipulation difficult to reach the epidural space so what i would suggest is go on the lower spine feel the lower spine push the needle till you hit the lower spine once you hit the lower spine pull it by 1 cm and then increase the angulation to about 70 degrees as depicted by the red line so you will go exactly in between the center of the two spines this is my suggestion now we'll have a video of a lower thoracic procedure being done the counting of the spines is being done up to 28 where the catheter tip is going to be placed we are planning 3 cm of the catheter inside so site of needle entry is going to be t9 t10 so we place 3 cm you come there basically i like to count from the sacrum or l5 s1 itself because when you talk of the anterior superior spine it may not always correspond to l3 l4 or l4 l5 so always count from below when you are a beginner so that is the space which you are going to enter the needle and see what i depicted in the previous line diagram the same approach same technique i am going to use to reach the lower thoracic epidural space needle entry i am trying to hit on the lower spine See that kindly appreciate the angulation, the seventy degree angulation which I am moving. Once you turn the lower spine, then you pull it back, and then I have turned the needle to seventy degrees. also while threading the catheter try to hold the catheter very close to the needle and push it because the pressure generated by fingers then each reaches the catheter tip more easily hold it close to the needle don't hold it far away like i said we want 3 cm of the catheter to be inside the space as per the principles of segmental epidural you can see the angle 70 degree angulation to the skin it is not at 90 degrees to the skin this is at the lower thoracic level just trying to explain the angulation there 5 cm of the needle is outside this is a 9 cm needle basically So why got nine centimeter needle, not a regular eight centimeter needle? See exactly as per the principles of segmental epidural, I place the catheter 
and see how I fix their catheter. I don't fix their catheter pushing it out, outwards. Because once you keep a sandbag, the sandbag pressure comes up place here and the catheter gets invariably blocked. So I try to take the catheter out in its natural direction. I just take it out in its natural direction. I, do, I roll it at a different, at that angle. Rather than fold the catheter and roll, I roll it this way. Now we are giving the drug. Checking is being done. So there is some pain at T4, but it settled after another two minutes. That is a T12. And see, only T12 is blocked. After that, the patient is able to move his legs. There is no motor blockade of the lower limbs. And that is a relaxation during surgery. Excellent relaxation achieved with a drug regimen I spoke before. And after the end of surgery, lasting about two and a half hours, a huge mesentery exists. You can see the patient still moving his lower limb. That means his lower limbs were never, ever, see, see that? Anesthesia. The anesthesia remained from T4 to T12. There was an upper level and there was a lower level. Below that, it did not happen. We almost gave about three doses of local anesthetic top-ups. Still, the anesthesia remained at T12 itself. So, same principles with the upper thoracic epidurals. See, these, are, these epidurals have been classified only according to the angulation of the spine. Nothing more. All breast surgery, simple mastectomies, modified radical mastectomies, reduction mammoplasty, CABG beating heart, fracture pain for upper ribs, all upper thoracic epidural what have to be used. The same principles just to reiterate and make sure that this principle of segmental epidural uh, get into our minds. Segments to be blocked are from C6 to T6 because for deep axillary clearance, a level of up to C6 is absolutely essential. So the catheter tip goes to T2, T3. So catheter length to be placed inside is 4 centimeters. So place between T4, T5. So naturally 2, two to uh, T3, 4 and 2 to cross T3, you come to the center of T2, T3 with 4 centimeters. Needle entry will be at T4, T5, where the angulation is almost 30 to 40 degrees. And 12 ml for a healthy, robust person, but up to 9 ml is sufficient for ladies. Most MRMs can be completed with 8 to 9 ml of local anesthetic. See, this is the angulation I'm trying to say about. The same technique which I applied for lower thoracic, I'm applying for upper thoracic also. But the angulation is steep. Suppose I go between the two spines. Naturally, I'm going to go and hit against the lower border of the upper border of the lower spine. So from there, trying to force your needle through is more traumatic. So what I do is, like I said, hit the lower spine, pull the needle back by one centimeter, and then angulate to 30 to 40 degrees, as shown depicted by the red light. The catheter goes in, the needle goes inside very comfortably, despite the severe angulation existing at that level. So it can be a midline or a paramedian because I'm more familiar with the midline and I use the a technique which I told in a previous slide. I always prefer the midline, but there are a lot of people who also use the paramedian approach to overcome the steep angulation. Position can be sitting or lateral. I always prefer the sitting position. I have never, very rarely have I used the lateral position. So I'm more comfortable in sitting position. So always I do it in sitting position. Another uh, depiction of your, uh, that is C7. The first most prominent spine is C7. Then you count all your spines up to. So blo blockade is going to be from C6 to T6. Or now this is going to be a simple procedure. So blockade is attempted from T1 to T6. So the catheter tip is going to be placed between T3 to T4. That is the center of the segments to be blocked. And the needle entry is going to be T5. Roughly, the tip of the scabla corresponds to C7. Roughly. Filling for the upper spine and filling for the lower spine. 
going almost on the lower spine. The upper thoracic is almost deeper when compared to the lower thoracic and lumbar. So first I go hit the spine at 90 degrees. You see the needle at 90 degrees. Now I turn the needle and bring it to that 70, 30 to 40 degree angulation and move forward. I think the angle is well appreciated in this uh, angle from above. The despite being a very thin patient, the needle has already gone inside for 5 centimeters. Extremely thin patient this patient was. This patient, if I do a lower thoracic epidural, probably by 3 centimeters, I'd be able to reach the epidural space. 4.5 centimeters is outside, 4.5 is inside. Because this is a 9 centimeter needle. So the angulation now, angulation of the needle to the related to the patient's back. Same principles, first two slides which I said, based on the same principles, the catheter is being pulled outside to fix it at around 5 centimeters inside the space to reach between T2 and T3. Yes. See, this is another technique which I very, very rarely use. Nowadays, I don't use it very much, but initially in my early stages, I was using. I use two catheters for anterior AP resections, radical cystectomy, bladder removal with row and y loop. And even for labor pain relief, I used to use two catheters. One for the lumbar pain where the uterine pain, another for the vaginal pain that happens. So what happens is I found that to be more useful because, so that is when I use even for labor pain relief, I was using that. Very limited usage. Same principles divided into two areas, thoracic area and the lumbar area. One catheter for the thoracic segment, one catheter for the lumbar segment or the sacral segment, depending on what procedure you are doing. Apply the same principles. For example, when you are doing a, a, a radical cystectomy, when you are going to remove the bladder, you activate the lumbar catheter. When you go above to the abdomen to trying to create a loop, you activate the thoracic catheter. This way, it could be quite useful in some cases. I've done about two to three cases in a double epidural catheter where a single surgeon was operating with a, uh, with a with with one of his postgraduates. So this was found useful. The surgery lasted almost six and a half hours. Still, the toxic doses were not used because whenever they were operating downside uh, in the lumbar region or in the sacral region, I was using a low concentration of local anesthetic in the upper region. So when used to come there, I used to increase the concentration. That alternation was done and that's how we did it. So the same way, uh, lumbar and now coming to the cervical epidural. Basically, according to me, doing a cervical epidural is as simple as doing a lumbar epidural because it is usually done at C7-T1 
or C6, C7. The only problem we face is that pad of fat that exists around that area in most of the people that makes palpation difficult and gives the rise to lot of false spaces when you use the loss of resistance technique, you get lot of false spaces in the cervical epidural region. So always when you come to cervical epidural, though initially I started my career doing a cervical epidural with loss of resistance technique, for the past 10 years, I shifted it to hanging drop only. Because of the high negativity in the cervical space, hanging drop is my favorite technique now. So basically for cervical disc procedures, where we do a lot of pain, give a lot of steroids, I use that for thyroid surgeries. And with a combination of a mandibular nerve block and a cervical epidural, I completed two cases of radical neck dissection also. Probably those photos are not available in this presentation. In different presentations, they have photographs of that, where the patient is fully conscious and the neck is fully thrown open, right up to deep dissection can be done. But of course, Doing a cervical epidural may be easy, but trying to maintain a cervical epidural for major procedures certainly requires a lot of experience, expertise and skill. The same procedures is applied here. The segmental epidural technique is applied, C71. One thing you want to warn you here is the ligamentum flavum fails to fuse in about 30% of the people in the midline, in the cervical region. So, the classical feeling of your epidural needle entering the uh, ligament of flavor may be absent. So naturally, you try to proceed further and with the loss of a lot of uh, false spaces which you get there and with false uh, uh, positive tests with your uh, loss of resistance technique, you usually have problems. So it can always go for a hanging drop is my suggestion. That is C71 mark there. You have to achieve full flexion of the neck to perform a cervical epidural, but invariably when there is a thyroid swelling, there is neck pain or neck disc the full flexion is not achieved. So here we are not able to get full flexion in this patient. This is the position, head is placed on the table. This was in my earlier, early in my career. Nowadays, I just tell them to bend the neck and I do it. I don't place the forehead on the OT table. I think the video is not running. Just give us a second. Yes. C71, the first most prominent spine is C7, the next spine naturally is T1. The position of the patient for a cervical epidural Full flexion is advised of the neck. The video is not moving after this. I think uh, Dr. Edward will skip this video. It's only going on for about uh, five, ten seconds. After that, it's not coming. Huh? Okay, okay. Uh, see, I think again it's coming. On this step, just on this step. Check, man. Just on the kai we can on this. But anger the potato potato. Okay, not, we are unable to play the video, so we'll skip it. And if possible, I have another uh, presentation. I'll just give the video clip 
anywhere in between if you allow me to do it permit permit me somewhere huh? so coming to the surprising pulse you see L3, L4 space is very rarely used in segment epidural anesthesia. It is invariably higher. Lumbar epidural should not be used for abdominal surgeries. Almost all surgeries below the level of T1 can be done under segmental epidural anesthesia as a sole anesthetic technique. And for cancer pain relief, epidural neurolysis and segmental epidural are inseparable. Even if you can't do a celiac plexus block, you can put alcohol into the epidural space Based on the segmental technique, say with 3 to 4 ml, you can achieve, given on 3 consecutive days, you can achieve pain relief for pancreatic cancers and abdominal cancers with this. And when you put these things into perspective, the most important aspect is your post-operative pain relief. So when you come to post-operative pain relief, the volume will be 0.5 ml per segment per hour of bupivacaine or ropivacaine or whatever drug you prefer to choose. So, for example, if your surgery, surgical pain relief or surgical anesthesia is required for 10 segments and you're going to use around 10 to 13 ml, 5 ml per hour of epidural infusion is fully sufficient to give pain relief for abdominal surgeries. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Raghavendra. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salamban. Can you stop sharing now? Excellent. Uh, yes, can, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Stop sharing. We can. Uh, okay. Wonderful talk, Dr. Silliman. A lot of uh, uh, valuable pearls to be learned today and then practical uh, points, actually. And uh, actually, you are now uh, um, shown us a way, you know, that it can be done at various levels, cervical, um, many of us won't even dare to the area. But you shown us the way how it can be done, and then uh, the lot of practical points learned actually. Now, um, to take it further, Dr. Naresh Paliwal is going to cross the dual barrier and then go into the spinal uh, subarachnoid space and tell us that segmental spinals is possible and probably simpler and can be achieved in a very effective manner. Okay, now we are really uh, we are eagerly waiting for to uh, listen to your talk, Dr. Narish Paliwal. Over to you. Lucky to give that. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible. Just a minute. I'll start sharing my screen. Is it visible clearly? Yeah, you can make it full. Yeah, okay. It's visible. Okay. Good morning, everyone. At the outset, let me thank Dr. Edward Johnson and the team online anesthesia for providing me this opportunity. And uh, I'm very much honored to have Dr. Raghavendra as a I mean, chairperson for this session. After a wonderful talk by Dr. Silliman about the segmental epidurals, I thought it would be a nice idea to, to have some similarities between the two techniques and what are the pros and cons of each one to begin with. So I'll start with a few points about comparing the, both the techniques. Now, what are the similarities between the two techniques? Both these techniques, uh, segmental epidural and segmental spinal, they produce a segmental block with minimal hemodynamic changes. For both the techniques, the injection site is most important. You need to place the injection at the middle of the dermatomes that is required to block that for that particular surgery. And the concentration of the drug affects the density of block in both the techniques. Like with lower concentration of drug, it will provide mostly a differential block, mostly a sensory block. There are a few positives about the segmental spinal as compared to um, segmental epidural, and there are some negatives also. So, uh, firstly, the segmental spinal is very economic as compared to segmental epidural. It's quick, and there is definitely an end point. Uh, like the free flow of CSA gives a confirmation that you are in the right place. Uh, there is early onset as compared to segmental epidural with segmental spinals. And there is uniform dense block with minimal drug. Minimal drug means uh, for segmental spinal, you just need 1 ml to spread 2 to 3 segments above and below the site of injection. And with epidurals, you need around 1.5 to 2 ml of drug per segment. That is nearly 1 to 1 tenth of that it is required at segmental spinals. 
Also, the segmental spinal covers both spatial and temporal summations, while the segmental epidurals may not cover the spatial sensations always. Also, the baricity of LA apart from those plays an important role in segmental spinals. You can always change the direction of flow using different baricity drugs in segmental spinals. And the failure rate is comparatively low, especially in cases of previous spine surgery. And if there are some spine deformities, then the chances of uh, failure are a little less with segmental spinal as compared to segmental epidurals. And obviously, as the dose required is very less, so the chances of last are minimal with uh, segmental spinals. There is also good relaxation, and the requirement of sedation obviously is less as compared to segmental epidurals. But there are some negative points about segmental spinals. Uh, like uh, there is no versatility to extend the levels. Once injected, you cannot uh, extend the levels afterwards. And also the duration of block cannot be extended. So it's not useful for post-op analgesia also. And the chances of pre-PH uh, as you're puncturing the dura are more, but that can also happen when you get accidental dural puncture during thoracic epidurals. The same thing can happen. And in my point of view, if the surgeries are major, then you can combine both the techniques together to have a better results. Now coming to my topic, segmental spinal. There is changing scenario about segmental spinals. Some 10, 12 years back, uh, let me clear it uh, first that I am not the I mean, inventor of this technique. This is a very old technique. I just regenerated the technique with use of different drugs. And some 10, 12 years back, when I started presenting this topic, my title used to be segmental spinal, is it possible? But that time, there was a lot of criticism about that. And everyone raised a question about the safety concerns in segmental spinal. So I started presenting about the safety concerns. And during this COVID pandemic, when everyone wanted to avoid general anesthesia, so many people, they started trying this technique and they found that it is very useful. So it became the most trending regional anesthesia technique that time. Recently, there was an article in British Journal of Anesthesia in April 2022, I think, about the defining the role of sequential spinal in 21st century. This was the article and the conclusion they provided, I'll just read out. Despite the absence of larger trials, there is evidence from the small court studies and multiple case reports that TSA may be considered a safe, feasible, effective alternative anesthetic technique and may be used in patients where other anesthetic techniques pose a high risk. This was the conclusion. Now, what is segmental spinal? The term is often used synonymously with the thoracic spinal, but even a low dose is used at a higher level levels can produce a segmental effect. So the ideal definition should be blocking of the required dermatomes essential for the proposed surgical procedure with very low dose injected near the targeted nerve roots. Here, what is important is lower the dose, more likely to produce a true segmental block. Otherwise, with higher doses, it can become your routine spinal. There are some factors which make segmental spinal feasible. At thoracic levels, the spinal cord is positioned anteriorly, leaving a significant space between the posterior dura and the spinal cord. The nerve roots are very slight and thin. The amount of CSF is also comparatively less. Both these factors make blocking of the required dermatomes uh, very easy at thoracic levels. And also there is no difference in the onset time for isobaric and hyperbaric drugs at thoracic levels. While the isobaric drugs may take a little long longer time for onset at lumbar levels. And there is also natural thoracic kyphosis at T765. There are some safety concerns which are always raised when you talk about the segmental spinal. The first and foremost is, can there be a neurological injury with dural puncture at high lumbar or mid to lower thoracic spaces? Can there be a ventilatory impairment with blocking of the intercostal muscles and uh, upper abdominal muscles? Can there be a bradycardia and hypotension with block extending uh, T1 to T4 and blocking cardioceptor fibers? And last but not the least, and most important is medical legal issues, as it is still not in the standard textbooks. Okay. Now coming to the first major concern, damage to the spinal cord. This is midline MRI. 
The cervical enlargement feels the entire spinal canal at the level. In the thoracic segments, the spinal cord is positioned anteriorly. You can see here, yeah, leaving a significant space between the posterior dura and the spinal cord. And at the lumbar levels, the lateral space disappears almost completely. Be more clear in the next slide. Here you can see there is sufficient space to accommodate your spinal needle at this site. In Belloni and Govia did a study on the low incidence of uh, neurological complications after accidental dural puncture in thoracic epidurals, and they provided an anatomical explanation for this. They measured the exact distance at various sites. At T2, they found the distance to be 5.19 millimeters. At T5, it was 7.75 millimeters. And at T10, it was 5.88 millimeters. Also, Lee Ari did study of anatomy of the uh, thoracic canal in different positions, like supine, lateral, and sitting positions. And they found that the distance was more in all positions at mid-thoracic levels, but more so in the lateral and most in the sitting positions. This is the position which most of us acquire for giving spinal anesthesia. You can see here the distance is almost 5.95 millimeters at T6 levels in sitting positions. The spinal cord sits ventral in the apex of the thoracic curve and more so when the neck is flexed and the uh, patient is bent forward. You can see left-hand side figure shows the distance between the anterior and the spinal cord. The right-hand side figure shows the distance between the posterior and the spinal cord. There is sufficient distance. Here again, the lateral view of the MRI. Because of the angulation which is required to perform spinal at mid-thoracic levels, you may need an angle of around 45 degrees at mid-thoracic levels, distance between posterior dura and the spinal cord is further increased. You can see here, the distance is almost 8 millimeters as compared to 4.5 millimeters at low thoracic levels. There are some additional points for in safety of segmental spinals. The, there are many studies about uh, low incidence of neurological injuries during accidental dural punctures in thoracic epidurals. There are n number of studies about this. And also, many anesthesiologists use high lumbar or thoracic spaces, especially in OB, OBs and parturient patients. They use these spaces inadvertently. What that means is they are already giving uh, this thoracic spinals unknowingly. Only in one study, only 29% of the people were found to be correctly identified the required intervertebral space for giving spinal. Also, the interpistial line always does not correspond with your L4 uh, landmark. It can be as high as T12 L1, L1 L2, L2 L3. And also, the level of spinal cord termination is variable, as high as T11 or as low as L3 level. You can see here, the interpistial line can vary. It can be as high as T12 L1. The second issue, which is often raised about segmental spinal, is ventilatory impairment. Here, the main inspiratory muscle of respiration is diaphragm, which is hugely unaffected. Expiration at rest is a passive process. But the forceful expiration and cuffing may get affected because of paralysis of anterior abdominal lower muscles. But because of the low doses of drugs used, there's a preferential uh, selective law uh, that preserves the cuffing ability, minimal motor weakness. About the bradycardia and hypotension, the heart rate may decrease, the block extends T1 to T4, but because of the lumbosacral sparing and less venodilatation in the lower limbs, the right atrial filling is maintained and that sustains the outflow from intrinsic chronotropic receptors maintaining the heart rate. The negative bend bridge reflex is not initiated. Less hypotension obviously is due to the low drugs used and less sympathetic blockade. About the medical issues and litigations, now there is enough evidence for cases where it is most indicated. There are n number of studies right now and you can always defend this when it is most indicated. And most cases of litigation are against regional anesthesia, but still the thoracic epidural is being performed day in and day out, even by the trainees. If that can be explained, then the accidental dural puncture or uh, intentional dural puncture in thoracic epidurals can be defended. Proper explanation and consent is must, but till the time it appears in the standard textbooks, we can keep our fingers crossed. 
feasibility of segmental spinal and indications there are four aspects of feasibility technical economic legal and operational technically it's not very difficult and different from your routine spinal those who are accustomed to doing a thoracic epidurals they will not find it very difficult even those who are doing lumbar spinals routinely just a change of angulation and uh, with precaution they can do it easily economic it's very very economic as compared to other techniques the legal still a question mark but can be defended with strong indications operational it can be operational at any setup uh, right from low resource setup to high end corporate setups about the indications all the intraabdominal surgeries all be it open laparoscopic major minor upper lower they all can be done under a segmental spinal Uh, breast and superficial thoracic surgeries and also some awake thoracoscopic surgeries like bullectomy thymectomy lung volume reductions they all can be done under segmental spine even some prone and lateral positions spine and musculoskeletal surgeries they are also possible what are the advantages of the spinal or at times over general anesthesia the surgeries which were thought to be out of domain of spinal anesthesia like upper abdominal thoracic and breast surgeries are possible with segmental spinal the higher levels of the block can be achieved with just half the dose that is required at the lumbar levels there is minimal hemodynamic fluctuations early recovery and voiding these advantages are apart from the advantages which all uh, neuroaxial techniques have over general anesthesia like uh, less post operative pain nausea or vomiting and there are special advantages over general anesthesia in patients with the respiratory comorbidities there is also lower incidence of post op nausea and vomiting there are three different modes of using segmental spinal it can be a single shot spinal for short to mid duration surgeries 90 to 120 minutes or it can be combined with epidurals for long duration surgeries or in a very morbid ill patients when you want to use a very low dose intrathecally for giving segmental spinal in those cases epidurals can be handy not only as a backup but also by epidural volume extension technique it can spread the low doses of drugs used intrathecally to wider segments and it can also be useful for post op analgesia the third option is you can always use continuous segmental spinal anesthesia for some major surgeries or whenever you get a accidental neuro puncture during epidurals by using spinal cats or interlong catheters drug options either isobaric or hyperbaric drugs can be used or a combination of iso hypo or hyperbarics can be used in general isobaric drugs are preferred for laparoscopic thoracoscopic breast and intraabdominal surgeries in morbidly frail patients where relaxation is not a issue hyperbaric drugs can be a choice in some male muscular patients for open surgeries hypobaric drugs are not used alone either they are used in combination with iso or hyperbaric drugs to have a sparse cephalic or caudate spread according to situation they are little bit unpredictable as the concentration used is very low and the volume used is more they are little bit unpredictable <coughs> sorry uh, advantages of isobaric drugs they are less sensitive to position issues and low doses have a propensity to block preferential sensory blocks sometimes labeled as selective anesthesia the onset is gradual hemodynamic stability early ablation avoiding spinal can be given directly in the operative position like some lateral position surgeries or even prone position surgeries you can directly give spinal in that position that saves time and efforts a spinal can be given before epidural what happens when you use uh, hyperbaric drugs you have only one choice you put a epidural first and then spinal unless uh, otherwise what happens with hyperbaric drugs by the time you put a epidural the drug gets settled to either unilaterally or cordially according to whatever position you are using for giving epidural but here you can use a spinal before epidural and a space higher than epidural and correct 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 and the cd problem there is there disadvantages of hyperbaric drugs Yes. level to block there is some disturbance actually please unmute yourself unmute yourself
Very empty, sir. Silpa, mute Naresh, sir. Silpa. The Naresh, sir, unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. I'm audible now. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, there are some disadvantages of isobaric drugs. The levels of block cannot be modified by change of position. You need to place the drugs at a required precise dermatomes. There is some sacral sparing with low doses at higher spaces. This can be an advantage at times or it can be a disadvantage, especially when the, you want to do a surgeries where pelvic manipulations is required. This can be a disadvantage, but otherwise it is an advantage to have sacral sparing with these drugs. There is longer answer time at lumbar levels. The less muscle relaxation may need to use higher doses for the male muscular patients. And they are also sensitive to temperature variations. Can have uh, behave like hyperbaric drugs when cooled to 25 degrees and can act like hypobaric when uh, they are warm at 37 degrees centigrade. Amongst the uh, available drug options, in the isobaric drugs, leobupiocan 0.5%, propiocan 0.5 and 0.75%, and also chlorprocan 1% can be used. In hyperbaric drugs, still now we had only bupiocan 0.5% heavy, but now leobupiocan 0.5% and ropiocan 0.75% heavy are also available, and they all can be used. There are many additives which... Uh, many people are using, but uh, the preferred ones, which will not lead to post of nausea, vomiting, and early recovery, are fentanyl, dexmit, 2 to 10 micrograms. Dexmit can prolong the duration in a dose dependent manner. Ketamine, ketamine has a propensity to block sensory nerves in preference, I mean, shorten the motor block time. They will increase the duration of sensory block. Clonidine can also be used in low doses. Now, this is important. How to decide the dose and the site of injection, like uh, Dr. Silaman said. And this also applies to segmental spinals also. Here, one ml of the isobaric drug spreads two to three segments above and below the site of injection. And accordingly, you can calculate the doses required for each surgery according to the dermatomes you need to block. But in general, for all abdominal surgeries, you can take it as a gross uh, statement that 2 to 2.5 ml of the drug block segments from two, T2 to L5 S1 with spinal at T10. You can do all intraabdominal surgeries of short to mid duration with this much of dose. A 10 thoracic space lying in the center of the surgical field for upper abdominal surgeries. Dose of local anesthetic additive and the site of injection can be varied according to need. You can vary everything according to your need. For breast and superficial thoracic surgeries, spinal needs to be given at mid-thoracic levels. Uh, preferred one is isobaric 1.2 to 1.5 ml maximum with some additives. It can provide a duration up to 60 to 90 minutes and little more, around 2 hours, if dexmed is used as additive with this much dose. You can always combine this with epidurals or some interfacial plain box for longer duration surgeries. These are the different levels required, as I already mentioned by Dr. Suleiman about the breast surgeries. I'll just uh, go through it. And uh, epidural scoring scale for arm movements, which is used to measure the motor blockage during thoracic epidurals, can very well be used to assess the motor blockage during segmental spinals. There are four grades, hand grip C8, T1, wrist flexion C7, C8, elbow flexion C5, C6. Position of the patient hardly matters uh, when you use uh, isobaric drugs unless you are using two drug technique where you need to use sitting position only. Plain DOBPO can 0.5% is slightly hypobaric with a specific gravity of 0 0.990. It is on the verge of being hypobaric and higher levels of block may be achieved if you keep the patient sitting for some time. Using two drug techniques, I already mentioned, sitting position is mandatory. Type of the spinal needle combined with epidurals. If you are combining with epidurals, CSC kit is the safest and easiest option. You can look at the epidural space with the epidural needle and in 
introduce your spinal needle that adds to the safety and efficacy of your technique. Either quinky or pencil point needles can be used, but with pencil point needles, the chances of paresthesia are more as the fluid exit side hole is around 1.7 millimeters from the tip. You need to enter around 2 millimeters more in the intrathecal space with pencil point needles and the chances of paresthesia are more. These are the landmarks as already uh, demonstrated by Dr. Silliman, but you can take the advant uh, advantage of ultrasound if you have an ultrasound machine. You can count upwards from L5S1 in the parasitical oblique view. You can identify the 12th rip and count upwards or identify the first rip and count downwards to locate the required spaces. There are some anatomical hurdles for thoracic spinal. The spinous process are sharply angled at T4 to T9. There's very narrow interlaminar spaces at these spaces. These are at times difficult with midline approach. So a paramedian or a paraspinous approach can be used. For paramedian approach, thoracic spinal, you need to be around one centimeter away from the spinous process and then an angulation of 15 to 20 degree immediately and around 45 degrees scaphoid angulation you hit the lamina first and then you can change the direction bit by bit to enter the interlaminar space. And the other approach is paraspinous approach. Slide alongside the spinous process, contact the lamina, angle cephalate to slip into the interlaminar space. I will show a short video about this to have a better idea about this paraspinous approach. This approach is many times we are using when we think that we are using a midline approach but we are in the paraspinous approach. Or even in the both of which make it easy. Note that the paraspinous approach is often what I call the midline approach. Not audible, Doctor. Not audible. Audio is moving. Video not audible. Okay, okay. Can I play it again? Okay. Sir. Angle of the needle. Here, the angle of needle should not be more than 5 to 10 degrees. Just alongside the spinous process. Not more than half centimeters away from the spinous process. If you go more laterally, then there are chances that you may go to the opposite side past the epidural catheter in the pleural cavity. That also may give rise to a loss of resistance sensation. This I already told you that this is the approach. When you think that you are in the midline, often the needle slips to one side and you go via paraspinous approach. A minimum angulation is the key in this just 5 to 10 degrees of uh, median angulation. Ultrasound imaging of the thoracic spine is very helpful. T10 to T12 are similar to your lumbar vertebrae. T4 to T9 are steeply angled spinous processes and overlapping laminae. There is very small window in the parasitical oblique view. Uh, and there is almost no window in the transverse view. This view is uh, about from knowing if there is any scolytic abnormality or not, this view is not useful, transverse view at mid-thoracic levels. This is just to show how it looks in the parasagetal interlaminar view at the thoracic spines. The uh, laminae look like a flat leaf-like appearance at uh, uh, thoracic levels uh, against the sawtooth appearance at the lumbar levels. There is a little gap in between the interlamin uh, laminae can be seen as an interlaminar space, but this may not always be visible in old and morbid obese patients. This can be visible in some young individuals. 
and you can also see the posterior complex, spinal cord, and the anterior complex. But this is the only view which is useful for a sagittal oblique interlaminar view. This is transverse view at the thoracic spine. You can see the, the spinous processes, lamini, and the articular processes are not visible in this view because they lie more anteriorly at thoracic levels. You can visualize the rib and the sliding pleura. As mentioned by Dr. Silamban, there is at times a gap in the ligamentum clavum at the cervical and upper thoracic levels. You can see in the right hand side picture, there is a gap in the ligament of flavum, which you can visualize with the ultrasound. And you may not get the classical sensation, loss of resistance sensation at this level. And you may have accidental dural puncture. So these things are to be kept in mind. There are some safety measures for successful use of segmental spinal. You need to do a thorough pre optic assessment. Uh, what are the dermatomes that are involved in that particular surgery? If ultrasound is available, you can do a pre-procedural scan. Identify the landmarks required for giving spinal, either by landmark technique or by uh, help of uh, ultrasound. Selection of the proper drug dose, site, and mode of segmental spinal according to your patient and surgery. After giving spinal, assessment of the levels, monitoring, and proper sedation as per need. This is dermatomes, which are already seen like for uh, MRM, you need C7 to uh, C5 to T7. Coming to my segment of spinal profile, more than 3,500 surgeries in the last 10 12 years, initially used for only high risk cases, but now occupies nearly 50% of my SAB profile. Till date, there have been very few partial failures, but fortunately, no mishaps. Recently, we had two live workshops and was one face-to-face -face interactive workshop in 2022. And there are more than three lined up in the next few months. I usually do a complete pre anesthetic evaluation of the patient, emergency airway card drugs all kept ready. When a success, minimum entry monitoring, no CDT pre medications. I usually prefer lateral position for giving spinal with 27 gauge needles drug dose site mode according to patient and surgery. For intra-abdominal surgeries, for very short duration surgeries like 40 to 60 minutes, or either open or lap, I prefer chlorprocaine 2.5 to 3.5 ml. Here the dose required is little bit more as it is only 1% of the drug. And because the volume is more, you don't need to go very high up. The levels around T11, L1 puncture can give you adequate spread. For mid-duration surgeries of 60 to 120 minutes, either ISO or hyperbaric drugs with some additives. For average female patient, 2 ml plus additives. Average male patient, 2.5 ml plus additives at around T10 level. This can be taken as a standard for all AC23 patients. I usually combine this with uh, either transverse abdominal plane block, rectation block, or ejector spiny plane block for open surgeries or local anesthesia at the port site for laparoscopic surgeries. For breast surgeries, I prefer isobaric, either leovipuic and ropuic, 1.2 to maximum 1.5 ml, with additive like fentanyl, ketamine, or dexmet when longer duration is required at T456. Usually combined with epidurals or some interfacial plane blocks like PEC1, PEC2, serratus anterior plane block, or recently I've started combining it with uh, full strength Erector spiny plane block for post op analgesia, and that is providing me a very good results along with second spinous. Now, something about the two drug techniques uh, you can use combination of any two ISO hyper with hypo or ISO with hyper. Uh, for uh, some abdominal pelvic surgeries where you want to have a longer duration of effect at the um, pelvic side, you want to have involvement of the lumbosacral roots also. You can combine hyperbaric with isobaric. You can give a spinal and sitting position at around T10 L1 level with 0.5 to 1 ml of hyperbaric drug followed by 1.5 to 2 ml of isobaric drug in different syringes with some additives. It can provide you a duration around 2 to 2.5 hours or even more if dexmed is used as an additive with this much dose. You can combine hyperbaric drugs also with either iso or hyperbaric drugs as I already mentioned to have a wider 
sparse cephalic or caudate spread with second block. After giving spinal, patient turned desired position. Sensory block usually sets in three to four minutes. Minimal, gradual, minimal and gradual hemodynamic fluctuations usually in initial ten minutes. No respiratory issues even with high levels of block. Initial partial involvement of the lung and bronchial roots can be seen, but to which recovers within uh, by the time your surgery is finished. There are no additional supplements. Levels are adequate. Patients can be completely mobilized in four to six hours. To sum up, it's a very useful technique with many advantages, minimal risks, with due precautions. No need to panic even if the block level is found to be higher than desired. Lab surgeries may need little sedation. If available, ultrasound can be helpful for more safety. A technique is reserved for experienced clinicians with good learning curve. There are some do's and don'ts about segment spinal. I'll just quickly finish. I think I'm not running out of time. Before proceeding, know in detail about the technique. What are the various drugs that can be used? What are the different doses? What are the attitudes and the sites of injection that can be um, used for different procedures? You also need to know about your surgeon. If you are not used to doing or working with him, you should know how accustomed to your surgeon is doing it in, especially regional anesthesia, especially the laparoscopic surgeries. How adaptable your surgeon is. To the change conditions that may provide uh, with your neurological uh, blocks, how flexible your surgeon is. If you request him to keep the initial intraabdominal pressure to a low, I mean around 12 to 14 to start with initial insufflation rate to minimum, how flexible he is to listen to you, and the efficiency of surgeon, how fast your surgeon is. Accordingly, you can choose your mode of secondary spinal. And you should know about the surgery, whether it is open lap, what will be the likely duration of your surgery, what the extent of your surgery will be. Suppose if the surgeon says it will be a just internal appendicectomy, and if you palpate the abdomen, you will find that there is guarding rigidity, and it's likely to be a perforated appendix. So you need to change your I mean, side dose accordingly in presumption that it may be a ruptured appendix and uh, may require a longer duration. You should, you should know about the patient also, how cooperative your patient is, whether he is willing for sole regional, what are the comorbidities of the patient, and the risk-benefit ratio of general anesthesia versus second spine. Always use the position you are accustomed to in giving spinal, either sitting or lateral, unless there is a special indication for using special positions. Do a pre-procedure ultrasound scan in difficult spine cases. That can be helpful to know if there is any abnormality in the spine, scolytic abnormality, or the depth of the interlaminar space. Do use CSC kit if you are combining it with epidurals for more safety and ease of doing it. Do always use multimodal analgesia with secondary spinals. Multimodal analgesia in the form of some blocks. If you are not combining it with epidurals, then you can use some blocks. Other drugs like paracetamol, dexamethasone, diclofenax, or the drugs which will avoid the respiratory depression and post-op nausea vomiting or early recovery. Do prepare and keep ready your backup plan as always. There are some don'ts. Don't force the surgeon to do it under uh, segmental spinal if he is not willing to do it unless there is a strong indication in favor of secondary spinal. Don't be rough and rusty. Advance gently, millimeter by millimeter. Always take your own time. There's no rush. You should go bit by bit, uh, removing stillet after every loss of resistance. That will add to the more safety of this technique. Don't proceed if there is slightest of paresthesia. Withdraw the needle and change the direction. Don't use higher doses of local anesthesia. Admit or high thoracic spaces to avoid undue respiratory and cardiovascular fluctuations. Don't unnecessarily add too many additives together. If you are not accustomed to using these additives intrathecally, use the additives you are accustomed to and don't unnecessarily add too many additives because someone is adding and unless it is very essential, don't use too many additives together. Don't use excessive sedation with higher levels of block unless you are Planning to secure the airway with either SEDs or uh, neutral tube. 
because what will happen if you use excessive sedations that may change the breathing pattern and may disturb the surgeon, especially in laparoscopic surgeries. Don't panic with early hemodynamic and respiratory issues. They are usually minimal and gradual, easily managed. Don't hesitate to call for help or communicate in case of any doubts. I will show some videos. This is at the lower thoracic. As I already said, lower thoracic levels are as easy as your lumbar spaces. There is not much of angulation. This is 27 gauge needle. Probably for some umbilical hernia. Not much of angulation is required at lower thoracic spaces below T10. I'll just go quickly through this. This is our third year uh, resident giving secondary spinal. We did a pre procedural ultrasound scan, uh, located the uh, space and the direction, and then asked her to give this was an obese patient, more than 100 kg for umbilical hernia. And she is going gently bit by bit. The space was located, the depth. Uh, was actually we are no eyes in ultrasound but depth could not be located but just the direction of the needle that was noted according to the probe this is how we should go remove the stillet at every loss of resistance This was umbilical hernia in a very obese patient. This is laparoscopic cholecystectomy with ETCO2 monitoring. This patient had diabetes, hypertension, old, slightly obese patient. Videos are not uh, actually. This is MRM uh, with combined uh, spinal and epidural, segment of spinal and epidural. Epidural was put at T4-5 and the spinal was given at T5-6. This okay. level is being tested. Nice. You can see the patient, how comfortable the patient is with even with such high levels of block. Nice. Just 1.2 ml of the drug. Nice. There's no sensation at uh, C8, but her grip strength was good indicating only a sensory block. This is MRM being done. This was a traumatic diaphragmatic hernia, uh, probably for the first time done under combined spinal and epidural. Here we gave the spinal first at T78 and epidural was put at T89. For spinal, we used 2.5 ml of the isovaric drug and spinal was given before epidural. You see, whole of the left hemithorax was filled with intestines. This is diaphragmatic mesh repair being done. This is the patient at the end of surgery. Can completely mobile. The next day x-ray of the same patient. This was a huge obstructed umbilical hernia. It was also done under combined spinal epidural. Epidural was put at T910 and spinal was given one space below. And see is the respiration. There's a whole transverse, full length transverse incision. This is a huge uh, ovarian cyst thought to be malignant in an old morbid lady. It was compressing all the interabdominal structures. It was done with two drug techniques. Just 0.5 ml of the hyperbaric drug initially and then 2, 2 ml of hyperbaric drugs at T12, 11, 11 in sitting position. It was a very huge cyst, so her uh, cyst had to be ruptured. A cystectomy, omentectomy, and hysterectomy was done in this patient. This is again MRM, epidural at T45 and spinal at T56. The spinal had to be given by paramedian approach in this patient. This is uh, 
at times uh, there are many uh, i mean queries about the cautery not working properly in regional anesthesia but if the cauteries are a bit high end and the currents are reduced and if bipolar cauteries use they work very nicely but there are few changes you need to make uh, with this technique as the same patient shifting herself this was tlh with two truck technique it was around two and a half hours procedure Let's see the patient shifting herself This is CA vocal cord post record occlusion for feeding gastrostomy. Spinal was a T89, just 1.5 mL of the tubercle and bilateral rectus sheath block. This is ruptured ectopic. Spinal was given a T112 with 2.5 mL of chlorprocaine and 25 micrograms of fentanyl. Yeah. You can see the whole of the abdomen is yeah. filled with blood. Actually, why can't you? This is a patient. Uh, she is a relative. She was a relative of a doctor for posted for TLH. She had atlanto axial dislocation with basilar invagination and diffuse disc bulges at T C five six. Her C one C two fixation was done, and she had very limited mouth opening. And she used to get what I go during neck movements. She was very much worried about her neck movements, and when can. Um, just uh, consulted her about the second spinal. She happily agreed to it, and it was done with two drug technique. This is ruptured liver abscess, twenty-one years female. Her hemoglobin was just four point nine, CRP was forty-three point nine, creatinine one point two seven. You see, the whole of the abdomen was filled with blood uh, pulse. This is usually how I monitor ETCO2. I put a 12 gauge uh, L cat tip to the ETCO2 probe. Whenever there is the special probe for ETCO2 monitoring and spontaneous is not available, this is simple appendix ectomy going on. The patient shifting herself. This is a pediatric patient, eight years old. पोजिशन टी ट्वेल एलवन This is after one and a half hours. Procedure went on for forty minutes, and this is after three and a half hours. She is completely mobile. This is a special patient. Actually, he was a patient with difficult intubation and was uh, intubated with difficulty, and somehow the, he was accidentally extubated before the surgery could start. Uh, there were a lot of issues the surgeon postponed the patient and he came back again after three weeks he was uh, actually um, told about this technique of second spine and he agreed to it and uh? here you can see he is watching his own uh, surgery uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, consent was taken this is male mrm recently done with uh, erector spinae full concentration Oh, the patient should be coming, sir. अरे कुछ भी नहीं। कौन से पैर उठा अभी? उठने से उठा दो ना। He had bronchial extrusions. This is six to two years female hypertension degenerative heart disease for MRM. She was a bit obese patient. She also was done with a rectus spinae plane block and rectus spinae with just one point three mL of the drug. Same patient at the end of surgery, and after three and a half hours, the patient moving herself. This is again eighty years perforated appendix, the last week only. You can see the abdomen filled with pus. These are my two publications, and thank you very much for patient listening. I hope I was clear through.
thank you dr nandish parewal you can stop sharing the screen now okay sir <clears throat> excellent talk and a lot of very valuable pearls learned today and you have shown us that um, uh, before the is it to not possible and the spinals you no know, is quite possible nowadays and really you have done a lot to popularize the technique and you have been a guide to so many people and then uh, you have been helping them to learn this technique and day by day you can see that more and more people are using this techniques as segmental spinals um and we have learned few things here today points that is uh, um as per one admission that we can't do it in uh, neck level cervical level as well as the caudal level whereas these are possible with uh, epidurals now so you confining yourself to mostly to lumbar and uh, the thoracic uh, levels for spinals is not huh? um then uh, i think is uh, what uh, uh, we can notice that you no know, the um, uh, the situations sometimes no um, is it possible now to do uh, segmental spinals in all situations now would you sort of um, uh, almost most of abnormal procedures nowadays we seem that no it is uh, possible to do with uh, spinals and epidurals as such and uh, barring a few uh, contraindications um, and then uh, another thing which is of gaining real popularity is the laparoscopic procedure which also nowadays um uh, brought under the uraxial anesthesia techniques uh, uh either sole anesthetic or even a supplementation procedure so um we have lots of questions uh, and clarifications from the audience and uh, um okay, we can just go over it one by one and I just want to ask uh, uh, as per dr anish tandulkar the question which technique causes better uh, post operative analgesia and, and lesser derangement of physiology the uh, yes asked actually now I just want to ask uh, dr selman um, uh, first then uh, maybe next uh, dr narish pale also can answer this can you repeat the question sir uh, which technique causes uh, better post operative analgesia and lesser the derangement of physiology i think basically when you go for a post operative infusion analgesic technique in epidural the concentration is anywhere between 0.725 to 0.125 percent where the hypotension is going to be minimal whereas when you use uh, use it at the spinal level i i am totally unaware of how uh, uh, totally my first time listening to a talk by dr naresh valiwal and uh, a lot of doubts and uh, i have no idea about how you go about uh, uh, segmental spinal and this is the first time i uh, listening to it so really i do I cannot highlight how much uh, uh, derangements will occur in the post operative period but as far as epidurals are concerned because of the low concentration of the bupivac that is used the derangement is going to be very manageable physiological derangement or hypotension management is going to be very manageable even if you for major surgery the whipples which last out 4 to 6 hours where you give in continuous infusion for almost 48 hours uh, most of the times they don't need nor at also for support We just fluids are able to manage. But Anish Parewal, you think that uh, post-operative analgesia is possible with this in, uh, con uh, with uh, continuous spinal anesthesia? Yeah, it, uh, there are two three things which you can do with segmental spinal. If it is not a short to mid duration surgery, you can always combine it with epidurals for post-op analgesia or some blocks, which will provide a longer duration of analgesia in these cases. The hemodynamic fluctuations are. in both segmental spinal and epidural are very minimal as the doses used in both are very minimal but for post op analgesia uh, yes epidural can provide a longer duration but you can always use a technique like uh, continuous spinal or continuous segmental spinal anesthesia even for some morbidity cases mm -hmm. i have done few cases i don't have that videos mm -hmm. and that was not included in today's topic so i avoided about continuous spinal anesthesia but you can use continuous spinal anesthesia in those cases without much of hemodynamic fluctuations okay uh, doctor uh, i think you are also mentioned about uh, use of uh, uh, that techniques like esp blocks and uh, yes that. like those can be those used. can be combined with segmental spinal for longer duration like for mrm nowadays i am combining erector spinal plane block with full concentration of drug like 0.5% levobupivacaine we nowadays the isobaric 
drug comes in vials only 20 ml vial what i do is i take 1.2 1.3 ml for my spinal and the remaining drug i use for erector spinal plane block in a full concentration as only unilateral is needed so you can have the i mean luxury of using a full concentration and that that is providing a very good results as you have seen that patient was completely mobile within 3 years she was she went to bathroom and uh, okay i all oral fluids etc now i think uh, there is one question that is uh, selman mentioned about you no know, uh, direct catheter caudally from the lumbar level yes. uh, now just uh, is it possible on on uh, to push the catheter caudally is it you know that lumbar levels uh, because usually we find that no it's not that difficult not that easy uh, to to cover the sacral segments so one person asked actually uh, what caudal direction of the catheter from epidural space sir we as we move lower down the volume of the epidural space naturally increases so catheterization is not going to be very difficult secondly when you try to push the catheter up if you can see the uh, the now roots go in the direction uh, like this so you have to go hit against the nerve root that is why sometimes you get paresthesia when you push the catheter up whereas when you push the catheter down you go along the course of the nerve so i don't think catheterization in the caudal side is going to be any difficult okay um and then one the senior question is uh, what about the paramedic technique you mentioned in your uh, all the videos about the midline techniques only yes now in classic level uh, is it not advantages to go for paramedic especially you know between the t4 to t9 like that no that is what i try to explain to you with a line diagram also instead of going in between the two spines we go and hit on the lower spine and angle at the needle it becomes very easy only when you go between the two spines you land up the trouble on hitting on the bones you go hit on the lower spine pull the needle back by about a centimeter then angle at your needle according to that suppose if it is lower thoracic angle at 70 to 80 if it is in the mid thoracic if it is higher thoracic angle at to 40 then naturally you have no other choice but to go between the two spines because from once you hit the lower spine and you angle it you naturally go between the two spines okay And Hello. Mostly, uh, right from our learning days, most of us are very comfortable with the midline technique. Okay, so you feel that? What about in uh, situations, say, for instance, a patient has got a, um, uh, some spine anomalies like kyphoscoliosis or side by bending? Not is there any special techniques you? See, this is basically, when you go for spinal anomalies, the use of an ultrasound can extremely be helpful to help you navigate it. suppose if you have a kyphoscoliosis or a scoliosis patient and you try to with help of an x-ray pre-op x-ray you try to navigate your needle i think it requires a lot of experience to navigate it through so basically all those all those kind of deformities always try to take the use of the ultrasound to know where your spines are located and direct the needle accordingly whereas when you go for these lower procedures the kyphoscoliosis usually starts at l2 l3 level i go at l4 l5 or l5 f1 spinal or an epidural where the spinal abnormalities may not be so significant okay actually convex site is said to be more open for giving spinal or epidural in scoliotic spines yes if yeah. you can feel the convexity then you always go from the convex site and yeah. the paramedian approach is yeah. always said to be very useful for mid thoracic because the interlaminar space at these levels is very minimal and at times it is uh, you find difficult to negotiate that space interlaminar space by midline approach so the trick is either go paramedian or paraspinous approach as i have shown just the uh, angulation towards midline should not be more many times uh, the angulation is more and then you enter to the opposite uh, side uh, i mean either intercostal space or uh, in other structures paravertebral spaces so the angulation should be kept to the minimum when using paraspinous approach and even for paramedian approach not more than 10 to 15 degrees uh, dr nadesh uh, you uh, you mentioned about uh, no, the use of segmental spinals in children um, is there any special considerations or any uh, points note when you are uh, no, even i have that uh, reference for uh, the 
distance between the posterior and the spinal cord even in children is more as it is in adults and just you may need some sedation before uh, uh, if the child is not cooperative okay otherwise so, there is no special you uh, have to be careful okay so this are the kind of, i think probably you you might be saying that even in children you can do it with a lot of safety the same yes. uh, the, the distance between the dura so to the quite a number of and even quite a number of cases uh, in second spinal laparoscopic and even open surgeries okay um so i just want to ask this question to both of you um, dr selman and dr ramit uh, dr naresh paliwal uh, see we some of we feel reluctant to use spinals in uh, uh, in a patients belonging to asa 3 4 5 and all okay now would you avoid it situation So, I feel still uh, these uh, these techniques are quite uh, feasible and quite safe. Excellent. Then later on, Narish. But AS three patients very comfortably. My uh, my my option of anesthetic choice is always epidural even today for advanced procedure because the segment for fee for uh, lower uh, limb uh, fracture surgeries or abdominal surgeries. AS three I still prefer to go for epidural. But as a four with excessive bleeding or very severe perforation with sepsis, those kind of cases, uh, I think he would already the BP is going to be quite low, and even in despite use of noradrenal vasopressin to maintain a BP above one ten may be certainly difficult. So that depends on case wise how you get the patient. What are the derangements that make you? It's a case a class three or a class four patient. I choose my anesthetic. Doctor Narish, you think segment is spinal is safer in AC three four nine? No, actually, my point is different. I can do all the cases. We choose the drugs and the dose concentration differently. I have done at least forty uh, fifty ruptured ectopics under the segmental spinal. Previously, I used to do it under uh, general anesthesia only. But nowadays, I just do it under chlorprocaine or isobaric drugs, even laparoscopic. So, initial just uh, brief hypotension can be managed. Otherwise, the patients uh, can be very well managed. And the due perforation, eight days old. Actually, my journey to segmental spinal started with these cases only. Uh, like patients from very tribal area, they come in very bilateral uh, pneumonia, eight days old perforation, ATBP, and That's how I started doing this, and then sorted for the references, and then started presenting it. So it is a little bit reverse journey. I started doing SA three four cases initially in second spinal. Mm. You can choose the drugs. I mean, uh, for some, suppose lower limb surgeries, you can choose hyperbaric drugs. They do even less hemodynamic fluctuations. Recently, mm. we have done some low ejection fraction cases for lower limb surgeries. Okay. Now, uh, no, Dr. Ganesh Tendulkar, he wants to know, uh, onco patient develops severe um, hypotension with the minimal doses, and he wants to know how we can avoid um, the epidural or the spinal hypotension aspect. Onco patients. Yeah. He feels that they are specific. They I don't know any onco. A prolonged many hypotension many. because of poor general condition. They uh, develop uh, hypotension. Do you avoid spinal cyst patients, or you can still go ahead and then uh, choose a lesser dose? Uh, hypotension or... can be managed actually, depending on the patient. What other comorbidities the patient has? Because if it is to happen, it will happen in general anesthesia also. I mean, depends on the what the comorbidities the patient have. I have done many uh, onco surgeries under the segmental spinal and epidural. Combine them together for better results, and. Even if there is some uh, hemodynamic changes, you can always manage it as you can do uh, along with your uh, uh, this thing general anesthesia. Yeah. The advantages here are patients' uh, post-op uh, chances of going on ventilatory support and pneumonia are less. Post-op analgesia is better. Any so anesthetic always... technique that produces hypotension may not be a contraindication for the use of spinal or epidural. Because we have wonderful drugs now to maintain the BP, and it is very easily manageable. 
whether it be an octo case or a non octo case whether you do it in the spinal uh, or you do it in the epidural if if, it, if the technique is supposed to produce hypotension it can very comfortably be managed unless it is a emergency surgery you can always take a time to build them up yes. uh, I mean, if they are in dehydration, you can correct dehydration before embarking on to your surgery. Uh, Priyadarshini wants. Now, uh, Priyadarshini, if the audience, he wants to know for upper abdominal uh, surgeries, what is the um, preferred technique for postoperative analgesia? And she also wants to know the incidence of uh, PDPH with uh, thoracic uh, segmental spinals. Incidence of PDPH is very minimal. as uh, already there is uh, less amount of csf at thoracic levels and the incidence is as compared to lumbar is very minimal till date i have not encountered to a single patient actually because i use 27 gauge needles always but uh, just a minor headache in one or two cases but not exactly pdph but not encountered any but uh, also the for upper abdominal surgeries you can use rectus sheath block or you can combine with depending on the what surgery it is bilateral rectus sheath block i usually combine for umbilical or epigastric hernias uh, dr silman and dr rish uh, see sometimes we get some really obese patients uh, present day you know uh, private setups now patients come with weighing about 130 140 kilos now uh is this epidural technique as a sole anesthetic technique still possible in such patients or uh, um you have some reservations or uh, you can suggest uh, some precautions or some how to it depends on for what surgery they are coming obese patients uh, they are coming for many uh, operations they have done operations bariatrics and and uh, what not uh, so some of them come for even cesarean sections also So I think uh, all this uh, is this um, uh, still possible, still safe in obese patients also as compared to you know general anesthesia. It's actually better if they can be done under regional alone. You can always combine two three techniques together. If you can combine spinal with epidural, if there is accidental puncture, you can convert it to continuous spinal or continuous segmental spinal. So there are many options. Also, you have options in the drugs. you can choose the drugs accordingly isobaric hyperbaric or hypobaric according to the levels you need to achieve if you want a higher capillary spread with head up position like for laparoscopic cholecystectomy you can choose hypobaric drugs along with isobaric drugs that uh, what it does is uh, it produces very sparse only just sensory block to the higher levels so the patient is not in very much discomfort no hemodynamic fluctuations if you want a uh, dense effect at the pelvic roots you can combine hyperbaric drug with isobaric so there are various options that can be put forward the weight of the patient is no contraindication for an epidural or for a spinal i have done a patient of up to 145 kg under pure epidural for an incisional hernia repair where the almost the intestinal contents are completely out of the abdomen for a very long time but only difficulty you will face is the technique where placing the catheter in such obese patients may be difficult but luckily the help of ultrasound pardon me ultrasound can be helpful yes no the advent of ultrasound it is going to help you very much so weight or obesity is no contraindication for the use of ep and spinal okay uh, one more uh, practical question uh, problem is now in laparoscopic operations With the steep head-on positions and abdominal, you know, just they put a peritoneal cavity filled with um, carbon dioxide. Now, uh, you think still it's still possible to do these cases with uh, epidurals or under spinal? Uh, Dr. Selman and Dr. Narish, both of you, I think, can, can give opinion. So, as far as I'm concerned, say about eight, ten, twelve years back, I started doing laparoscopy surgeries under. pure epidural certainly i was able to complete most of my surgery say about 60 to 70 60 to 60 percent of surgeries comfortably by other 35% i did have problems especially when the pneumoperitoneum was induced and the air was pressing on the diaphragm patient did feel discomfort and next thing is the steep head down position some surgeons ask and there i always felt the quality of the surgeon was more important than anything else 
some surgeons have fin- finished lap coli in 20 30 minutes mm-hmm. so that time that way when you have a pneumoperitoneal lasting for a shorter period of time some patient discomfort are used to manage its sedation but some people even do it for one and a half hours that time is certainly in about 20 to 20, 30 percent of patients i had problems with the pneumoperitoneum mm-hmm. pressing on the diaphragm Yes, sir. That's what I told in my do's and don'ts. That know your surgeon, whether he is accustomed to doing it in regional anesthesia or not. Yes. First thing, because if he is not accustomed to doing it in regionals, he will complain for anything. The second thing is how adaptable your surgeon is. I mean, if you ask him to keep the initial intra-abdominal pressure to minimum, what I ask to my surgeons when doing under regionals, I ask them to keep it around twelve or maximum fourteen. initially and the initial flow rate i asked them to keep minimum around 2 to 4 liters per minute so that sudden inflation may at times stretch the peritoneum and can, can cause discomfort that i have seen even under general anesthesia the patients can get severe bradycardia with such uh, flow rates but these are a few things which i asked my surgeons and also prefer isobaric drugs for laparoscopic surgeries because with steep head down tilts if you use hyperbaric drugs they can spread uh, downwards and uh, also the isobaric drugs they have a propensity for pure selective i mean mostly a differential block mostly a sensory blocks so patients don't feel any i mean discomfort because the muscles are usually spared the respiration is good so done quite number of uh, these surgeries laparoscopic surgeries the levels need to be adequate for these surgeries about t2 at least okay. but uh, <clears throat> the thing is now, now what about uh, now the one thing everybody wants to know is uh, the legal implications uh, i think you did touch upon that actually you know so um, epidural i think probably people have accepted it because um, you don't really go near the dura i mean you don't find the dura and don't, don't go near the spinal cord but always is theoretical concern and possibility that uh, the cord may get damaged so this is what is inhibiting people who are sort of you know um, advising against uh, the finals um i think the legal implications uh, uh, is it can it be overcome uh, in a due course of time or is it a real serious problem nowadays which is preventing people to uh, go into this uh, aspect of you know it's quite a quite very useful uh, uh, technique can then um, can be is feasible and can be done for a lot of situations now a lot of procedures so what do you think about it dr narish what do you want huh? i just wanted to ask uh, how will you defend if you get accidental dural puncture during thoracic epidurals i mean is it defendable <laughs> i mean there you are telling ki you are doing a epidural and you accidentally punctured the dura but in second spinals uh, till the time it appears you can select the cases properly in the cases where it is most indicated you can always justify i think there are many many publications about this where general anesthesia even the recent article in british journal of anesthesia that can be taken as a uh, reference point there also they have mentioned that can be useful for certain situations where you think that a general anesthesia can be risky So it can be defended with strong indications, but for routine surgeries, I'm not sure. I mean, you have to be confident that you will do it nicely, and then only you can do it. I have a question for Doctor Narayan Palival. Just out of yes, sir, sir, when we do a segmental epidural, say for example, mm-hmm. the level is from T4 to T12, the regression of anesthesia is from both ends. Yeah, it is. Uh, from both ends it's from both ends whereas when you do a conventional spinal the regression is always from above below above above below for example that is because most of the time what do you me, use is a question sir huh? for example you do a lumbar spinal for a bottom surgery at l2 l3 level give only 0.8 to 1 ml so what happens is the block starts coming roughly the block is from t12 to s3 s4 and it starts regressing from above below only doesn't does it regress from below upwards also is my question no it is the difference of the drug you are using actually the so you using hyperbaric to be again then what happens sir hyperbaric you it regresses from above downwards 
अबाउट डाउनवर्ड्स यस विथ आइसोबेरिक इट इज जस्ट लाइक योर एपिड्यूरल्स ओके इट रिवर्सेस फ्रॉम बोथ एंड्स आई गॉट इट ओके वन लास्ट क्वेश्चन बिफोर वी फाइंड अप आई थिंक ऑलमोस्ट नियर द एंड ऑफ द प्रोग्राम वन मोर क्वेश्चन फॉर डॉक्टर नरेश सर सर कैन यू एलैबोरेट योर टेक्निक ऑफ हाई थोरेसिक स्पाइनल इन केसेस ऑफ very much anticipated difficult intubation uh with patients with difficult intubations yes high thoracic because in case there is a small error and it becomes a total yes, yes. you know ventilate yes. for a very long time uh with what difficult have, intubations what uh, experience with that and giving, what exposure to such cases giving regional will not solve the issue of uh, difficult intubation you need to be prepared with uh, everything about difficult intubation before embarking on to the spinal or any other anesthesia even for lumbar spinal also you need to take all the precautions you need to be prepared with uh, everything which may be required for that difficult intubation yes you you right sir i i, I do accept my my question is different say for example for a femur sir, fracture i'm giving 2 cc of uh, uh, hyperbaric uh, Uh, BP again at L three four. Hmm. Chances that I may lose the airway is very minimal. Then when I give it at the high level of T ten or T nine. So what would be your for, advice? Please, my question. For lower limb surgeries, you don't need to go higher up. You can always do it with lumbar spine. No, I'm talking about the higher surgeries when you have a difficult intubation. What is your experience? i i do it with all precautions i mean i have all the gadgets uh, ready with the uh, difficult intubation is required no 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 fiber optic no but that scope i have i have that intubating guru may i have three points may i have three points for this question in case of difficult intubation uh, guidelines they advise regional anesthesia even in the presence of difficult intubation we can go for regional anesthesia With uh, definite precautions should be taken for the difficult angle. So the, the, that's yes. that's the answer for this question. Right? Yes, that is what I am saying. That you should always uh, take all the precautions that may be needed in case there is any emergency. You should always be prepared for that, and then only you can embark. Uh, sir, there is uh, yes, sir. the question. The question is very simple. The question is. You don't have a fiber optic bronchoscope with you. No, you the fiber optic bronchoscope, bronchoscope is not needed. I I have a task. You mean you are assuming, a... assuming it has become a total spinal. Suppose yes. you go for a GA in that procedure. You are going okay. to ventilate for about three to five minutes because the anticipated difficult intubation. You are going to give succor methanium. Here, if it becomes a total spinal, you may have to ventilate for one hour. So, what is your advice to me? Is my question. See, we uh, everybody, every case, we keep every precautions for a difficult intubation or a loss in airway for every patient. These specifically anticipated patients, where you go for a scolene intubation, where you are in trouble of not intubating, only for five, and you don't have a fiber optic bronchoscope, you ventilate only for five to seven minutes before the patient comes out. Whereas when you give a high thoracic spinal, the duration of loss of respiration is going to be more than forty-five minutes or even an hour. So how do you? What is your experience? What is your? I'll, I'll experience? tell you just one experience. Yesterday only, I was called by a physician. Uh, case of severe pancreatitis. Who went on uh, in failure, and uh, she he was not able to intubate that patient. She was very obese patient, and she was uh, semi conscious and not opening her mouth. Actually, uh, she was keeping her mouth closed. It was difficult to intubate. Tried opening scolene was not available. and uh, she was ventilated for some time and then at the last resort uh, what i did was uh, took a cvv line guide wire did a retrograde intubation in that patient so there are many things which uh, you need to be um, innocent with like i can do blind nasal i can do uh, and blind intubation after giving scolene or you can use scds So, prognostic devices in such cases for time being, or we have Tascope, which is also very helpful. We have Bujing ventilators. We have Cricothyroid atomic kit. So there are many equipments available, even if you don't have fiber optic uh, bronchoscope or uh, this thing available. Okay. 
I just going to give an opinion on this. Um, my own opinion only. See, I think whenever we have a difficult airway situation anticipated by elective operation, which is likely to be a, a very severe uh, procedure and maybe with a lot of fluid shifts and all, I feel it's safer to go ahead with uh, securing the airway first, maybe awake, FOB guided or whatever technique. And then only you know, venture uh, into other, I mean, uh, give GA for case. No? This is my opinion, actually. Uh, region oh, is, you can, uh, use it. you can use it uh, if at all. Uh, the peripheral operations now, which are not likely to cause much of a problem and uh, anticipated problem is not much. But still, whatever you said, uh, apply. See, like keep everything ready in case of difficult. But when you anticipate difficulty and there's an operation of, of a major nature, I think better to go for a, you know, secure the airway yes. first. And what I feel. Okay. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It depends on what procedure you are going on for. If you are going for a lower limb surgery where the chances of patient requiring intubation are very minimal. So in that case, you can just prepare for the uh, everything ready and then go for regionals. If the procedure is like such that you may need, there are a high risk of intubation. In such cases, you need to secure the airway first. I mean, uh, major procedure or major fluid shift, as you said. In those cases, you can choose the technique accordingly. But when the chances are minimal, that uh, patient going in for total spinal with very minimal drug are very minimal, or patient getting some uh, anaphylactic reactions, or patient going in for shock, the chances are minimal. In those cases, these are rare happenings, can happen anytime. In those cases, you can prepare your and difficult airway cart ready, everything ready, and go in for regionals. There is two questions from Bala Baskar to Naresh Parival. The yes, first sir. question is, uh, in case of patients with low cardiac output, uh, can we take a segmental spinal? The second question is, how to manage a shoulder pain in segmental spinal? This is from our senior one. I'll doctor. take the second question first. The shoulder pain is uh, not encountered if uh, adequate levels with uh, segmental spinal are achieved. I, and a uh, few things which I already told that uh, uh, intraabdominal pressure and the uh, flow rate, initial flow rate kept to minimum. Uh, these things, if they are uh, taken care of, then usually there is no shoulder deep pain. And if it is there, you can use the sedation like dex kit that can be used. And the second question about the low ejection fraction cases. I have done many cases with uh, like one case of PPCM, peripartum cardiomyopathy, which I did was having an ejection fraction around 26 only. And there what I did was I did with uh, just one ml of the isobaric drug and combined with it epidural. Just one, two ml of epidural top-up was needed along with one ml of isobaric drug and the patient was uh, okay. Next day she was moving. The epidural was used for post-op analgesia also. So you can combine these techniques together. You can combine two drug techniques also for such cases. Thank you. Sir, please come. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Naresh and Dr. Uh, Salimban, uh, after giving an you know, epidural or spinal as a sole answer technique, how do you take care of patient comfort intra-op? Like what kind of comfort? You're talking about sedation? Yes. Because they are going to be awake and then major operations are going on. And then how do you sort of take an intraoperative comfort? So no? Sedation is required. We sedate the patient either as midazolam or dexmeritomerin or combination of both. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Intrathecal uh, adjuvants we use generally. And very little sedation is required up to that. So when you go Plus what I do is stuff. I use some blocks additionally. So when you go on a total continuous epidural, like staging laparotomies, which may last up to four to five hours, uh, good sedation is certainly required for the surgery to proceed. Because uh, when you talk about a continuous epidural technique for surgeries about whipples or cystectomies, it may last four to seven hours also sometimes. Staging laparotomies <laughs> take such a long time. So pure epidurals, if you have to do it under them, good sedation is a must. I use yes, a common recently we have started, recently we have started doing it in the uh, continuous spinal with uh, new catheters available, interlong, 25 gauge catheters. 
that provides uh, very dense and effective blocks with very minimal drugs for long duration surgeries in very morbid uh, ill cases okay mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much dr narish and dr silamber it was a very wonderful um, session and uh, we have learned a lot of uh, new points and uh, that you now we can extend uh, this you uh, know this a technique to so many um, uh, operations now and previously uh, thought to be not feasible not possible is not possible after listening to the lecture i'm sure that uh, the audience would have benefited and who were watching would have sort of uh, uh, learned a lot of new things and um, uh, of course we have to be careful and then we have to go careful. we have to sort of do a few things the lumbar level first then go into the thoracic level and expertise is gained and uh, as indicated by dr harish paliwal these techniques are quite safe and possible and uh, theater concerns aside and legal implications aside they are uh, actually opening up more opportunities now give, giving us more um, um, joy actually as far as technique te techniques are concerned and uh, we had used our uh, discretion and then choose the techniques in a very judicious manner okay um, thank you so much uh, i think it was a wonderful session okay we'll uh, i'll wind up with this thank so, you sir thank you okay. raghavendra thank you very sir. much for providing me this opportunity thank you raghavendra sir thank you dr lamban dr edward i hope it was uh, i mean fruitful presentation thank you everybody thank you dr narey sir thank you sir thank you all the conferences okay yes sir thank you raghavendra yes, sir for your excellent conclusion i thank the speakers the dr silamban for highlighting the go very old golden technique of epidural which stands uh, for the time for the time and also i thank narish paliwal for updating that new technique in our uh, uh, armatorium of anesthesia and uh, he's is excellently concluded as the do's and don'ts which has to be carried out in our practice thank you for the speakers dr silamban and dr narish paliwal for this wonderful session it was a very good uh, received session and many senior members like balabaskar sir and uh, professor kannan has attended i am very much uh, pleased to have them in our uh, forum and thank you and all for the viewers we will meet next week with a more interesting topic thank you thank you thank you and all thank you very much thank you any everybody. questions thank remaining you. we can answer on the forum okay sir we will carry out the further discussion in our uh, online analysis here for thank you okay thank you very much thank you thank the akurla and the even thank you thank you analysis tv thank you super weekend